Who is ready for episode two of Ratchet in all its camp and gore? We're actually going to learn something though. We're going to learn something about a dark period in psychiatry's history, a procedure called the lobotomy. We're going to learn about a disorder called schizophrenia and how to differentiate it from another condition called schizoaffective disorder and how to distinguish somebody that might be mentally ill from somebody who's faking the symptoms. There's a lot to learn, so stick around and hopefully you'll enjoy. That's some sort of primitive inhaler. I imagine it's some sort of opiate he must be taking. You can tell from the lights and the music and the way that he's responded that it's clearly something psychoactive. Chasing the dragon is always a good quality that you want in a safe doctor handling sharp instruments. <laughs> My melancholia has gotten the better of me. I wake up in strange places, not knowing how I got there. Melancholia is an old term for depression, but actually what it sounds like she's describing here are episodes of dissociative fugue. Dissociation is this disconnection between your mind and your body. It can manifest as a disconnection from your own sense of identity called depersonalization, or from your surroundings and your environment called derealization. It can affect your sense of time. It can affect your memory. Dissociative fugue are periods of reversible memory loss during which you lose a sense of where you are and who you are. These are usually brought on by periods of overwhelming psychological distress that represent one of your mind's defense mechanisms against this. I read about Dr. Hanover's miracle procedure in the San Francisco Chronicle. <laughs> miracle procedure? Oh, this is going to be the lobotomy, isn't it? I knew I had to give it a chance. Spoiler alert, it wasn't a miracle, it was barbaric. It's, in my opinion, one of the darkest periods of psychiatric history, but there's no pretending it didn't happen. Hello. What's your name? Peter. It's nice to meet you, Peter. I'm Lily. What brings you to see Dr. Hanover, if you don't mind me asking? My mom says I daydream. Wow, but I can't say it didn't happen. Psychiatrists in these days would see people that were just behaving a bit differently to what society deemed to be appropriate and acceptable. And therefore they would end up partaking in so-called treatments that in essence were really just forms of social control. Daydream away, kid. That's where the world's creativity comes from. Friends, today we stand together on the practice Is he still high? of history. But he's so energetic. Is that a stimulant that he's inhaled? I can't think of a stimulant that you can inhale that then can be psychoactive on the brain that was around in the 50s. If you've got any ideas or thoughts, put them in the comments below, because I'm not really sure. Oh, I nearly forgot. There will be some observers in the operating theater today, just some government officials and a reporter. Nothing for you to concern yourselves with. I'm sorry, a reporter? I was hoping that the details of my condition would remain confidential. What, that you're a lesbian? That much is plain. It's made obvious by your facial structure. I don't know of any concrete evidence to suggest that the lobotomy was actually used to treat homosexuality, even in this really dark period of psychiatric history. A lot of other things were used, everything from chemical or surgical castration to electroconvulsive therapy to talking therapies that still remain the basis of conversion therapy that is somehow still legal today. Phrenology is the name given to studying skull shape and skull structure as a means of determining psychological attributes about a person. It's all rubbish. It's nonsense. Here's Dr. Hannover. A visionary who, like the governor, believes that our correctional system should do exactly that. Correct, rather than penalize. This is just very exciting. These were named operating theatres because people really did sit in the stands and watch. There's a good example of one of these attached to a museum near Guy's Hospital in London that you can visit during certain hours if you're ever interested in seeing one. From the kit that's there, though, this is going to be the lobotomy. I present to you the lobotomy. 
In 1935, Portuguese neurologist Antonio Egas Moniz first attempted a procedure that I now wish to make commonplace. A procedure so straightforward it can be performed on all four subjects in a quarter of an hour. Interestingly, Moniz was also responsible for the first version of a type of imaging that we still use today in medicine called angiography. This is where we can use x-rays to take pictures of blood vessels by injecting dye into those blood vessels so they light up and they're easier to see. Yet, it's the lobotomy that he won a Nobel Prize for. Unbelievable. It was then the neurologist called Walter Freeman that made it more commonplace in America. And I think here, the doctor is basically taking on the role of Walter Freeman. The brain's frontal lobe is the seat of neuroses, juvenile distraction, mania, memory loss, lesbianism. All of these maladies can be subdued, if not reversed, by surgically disrupting a series of neural connections in the brain's white matter. So the theory behind the lobotomy actually stemmed from observations that were made in monkeys, where if you remove the frontal lobe, this made them more subdued and more docile. People thought, oh, maybe this will be helpful, or at least help us, in trying to reduce the distressing behaviors associated with mental illness in humans. So the lobotomy was designed to try and sever connections within the prefrontal cortex. This is responsible for decision-making, motivation, behavior, all the stuff that kind of gives us some sense of personality and makes us human. So after these connections were severed, people weren't impulsive. In fact, people weren't really making decisions at all. They became robotic and devoid of any sense of personality. But it was in keeping with the held belief that unfortunately still persists in corners of mental health today that if nobody's making a noise and nobody's making a fuss, then clearly there is no problem. As you can see, the patients have received only the lighter sedation and will awaken those slightly groggy as brand new individuals unencumbered by the mental illness that brought them to this place. Just because somebody's sedated and asleep doesn't mean that they can't feel pain. I encourage you to sit back, relax, and bear witness as I touch the mind. We're going to stop there. I'm not going to show you the procedure because that's not what this channel's about. And it's just going to be graphic and gross and new, new. Next. I was appalled by yesterday's surgeries. The lobotomies did not go at all how I had hoped. And I alone am to blame. Therefore, I will be demonstrating an alternative procedure in the operating theater in 15 minutes. I expect to see you all there. It's going to be the transorbital lobotomy, isn't it? That's the next logical step. Your periodic reminder that psychiatry does not do this today. I obtained these cadavers from the Oakland County Morgue. Upon viewing the reaction of our guests yesterday, I realized the trepanning of the skull by boring through the sphenoid bone with a hand drill. Might be a bit too graphic to be accepted by the general public. No I recall the observations of the Italian psychiatrist Amaro Fiamberto. He complained that the prefrontal lobotomy requires drilling through the skull at its thickest point only to access the side of the frontal lobe, while its quivering underbelly can be more easily accessed through one of the skull's thinnest points, the eye socket. Oh, no. Behold the transorbital lobotomy. As if designed to comfort any queasy onlookers, the procedure benefits from the everyday nature of its instrument. A simple tool that John and Jane Q. Public already have around the home. An ice, ice pick. pick. The original lobotomy was designed to be done through the sides of the skull, and he's right, it's through a bone called the sphenoid bone, which is super thick. So including the anesthesia, this procedure was thought to actually take around about an hour. The transorbital lobotomy took about 10 minutes. When Walter Freeman came up with it, he just did it in his office. The roof of the eye socket or the orbit, much like the bone at the top of the nose called the cribriform plate, super thin, easily perforated, and then the brain is sitting there right underneath. Simple. Stupid. Elegant. Barbaric. Here. How are you feeling today, Edmund? Uh, just real warm, I guess, because I'm feeling a little nervous. Well, Edmund, there's nothing to be nervous about. I'm just here to get to know you. Okay, yeah, but lots of the times folks say that and then they try to read your mind. That's why I'm so nervous. And that window's got a migraine and it's giving me one too. First of all, really, really bad positioning in the room for the doctor. You're in there with a person who's killed four people and yet you're standing furthest away from the exit against a window. Safety first. Always, always safety first. 
Don't walk right behind somebody that is clearly trying to tell you that they're paranoid. You're only going to make somebody more anxious that you're going to sneak up on them from behind. He's looking around the room a lot. Is he trying to act like he's hallucinating? Like he's hearing voices coming from lots of different places? It's either really bad acting or he's faking it because he's being way, way, way too obvious about it. Ladies down at the AMP, they were always trying to read my mind. That's why I killed him. Being able to read somebody's mind, that would be in medical terms, something called thought broadcast, where your thoughts are being broadcast to other people so they know what you're thinking. Help. Oh. Uh, those girls you say I killed. Oh, maybe I didn't. I'm kind of trying to switch all my thoughts around behind my back. I'm sorry. What girls are you meant to have killed, Edmund? This is something called thought manipulation. Thought manipulation can be seen alongside some other features like thought insertion, where an external agency is putting thoughts into your mind. Withdrawal, removing thoughts from your mind, or thought broadcast that we've already talked about. Those girls you say I killed. They all live together in a house. Visual hallucinations? You know, and I them At least that's the he impression says, he's trying to give. You, but then you says I did kill him, so... Edmund, those were four men you murdered. They were priests. <sighs> See, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's why I gotta talk to the dentist. Why would you need to see a dentist, Edmund? Because I got radio mouth. I got radio mouth real bad, a bad case. And you're listening in to, I heard your voice before, you're listening in and whispering these numbers, but you don't know I can hear you because the antenna is so good. What is radio mouth? Well, see, I told them all before. These guys came into the rooming house where I was staying, four or five of them, and they said, we want to sell you something. And I said, I got a bus to catch. And then one of them said, well, we already put it in there. And they showed me. And they put a little tiny metal radio antenna under my back teeth with a the gums. And then when I'm sleeping, these wires come out of my mouth. Here, here, and here, and here, and back here. So this thing, radio mouth that he's calling it, this may represent something called a tactile hallucination, where you're feeling something that isn't really there and he can feel something behind his teeth. But on top of that, there is a delusional interpretation of what that thing actually is and what it means. So you feel something that isn't really there and you interpret the meaning of that in a delusional way. And then the landlady downstairs says, no, we took those out while you were sleeping. But I says, well, how come I keep pulling wires out of my mouth then? <laughs> you know? This is all a bit too perfect. He's literally ticked every single box for signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. This is too neat and tidy. This is either a Hollywood perception of schizophrenia or he's faking it. And who do you think is changing your thoughts right now? I think it's the army. Edmund. The person I see before me exhibits multiple symptoms of schizophrenia, or perhaps schizoaffective mood disorder with psychotic features. It's not schizoaffective disorder. Schizoaffective disorder, at least the way we diagnose it in the UK, is where somebody has experienced psychotic symptoms that have impacted their functioning for the same period of time that we would expect for schizophrenia. And then another period of time has exhibited a period of really severe mood disturbance, either really severe depression or mania. It's kind of a mishmash and a hybrid between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. I'm not convinced about this evidence for schizophrenia, and we've certainly got no real evidence for an affective component components there were mood disturbance. You're experiencing paranoid hallucinations both auditory and tactile. Your delirium, the dementia, your grossly disorganized speech, the delusion of thought broadcasting, your fears of an inchoate unseen conspiracy plotting against you. These are all prototypical features of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. well, okay, sure. They're somewhat too prototypical, actually. So perfectly presented, they actually strain credulity. Can I have a cigarette? Not that I'm smug, but I do like it when I'm right. I've seen crimes so heinous they beggar the imagination, but not one that I felt warranted state-sanctioned murder. I believe that the human mind can crack. I believe a person can snap when experiencing certain stimuli, specific traumas. A person can quite literally lose control and commit unspeakable acts of violence and depravity. They can rape and mutilate one priest, stab another, shatter the skull of a third, and nearly decapitate a fourth, and still they are not necessarily insane, nor are they beyond rehabilitation. 
I actually agree with this. Not everybody that commits a crime is mentally ill. In fact, it's the minority. And I agree that the mind can be rehabilitated. It's just not quick. Tell me what you remember, Father. Did you see his face? Oh, yeah, because they're brother and sister. Edmund Tollison? Would you recognize it if you saw him? What is that? From under the bed, I couldn't see his face. What could that be? Is she going to kill him? Or is she just going to try and sedate him? They used to use a barbiturate called sodium thiopental as a so-called truth serum, which is trying to get information out of him. Either way, this certainly isn't the most ethical nurse in the world, is it? Finish it up now. Drink your poison. Barbiturate, do we think? I mean, benzos weren't discovered until the 50s. The first one that was discovered was one called chlordiazepoxide that we still use in alcohol withdrawal occasionally today. Either way, it's all kicked in a little bit too quick after taking a few sips for it to get through the gut, past the liver, all the way up to the brain. Then again, waiting the 30 to 40 minutes it would normally take isn't exactly compelling telly. I'm going to relieve that suffering. So she's going to kill him? Oh no, she's going to lobotomize him. It's not a DIY thing. I mean, Walter Freeman did do them in his own office, but in a bedroom, this is, this is, yeah, this is too much. Father Andrews, we're from the state attorney's office. We're representing the people in the Edmund Tolleson murders. We need you to provide an affidavit. Do you know what that is? Father Andrews, can you hear us? Devoid of personality, as we said earlier. If you hide the outward signs of distress, then clearly there is no distress, right? Well, obviously, no, that's not true. And now you've also taken away this person's personality. <sighs> it touches on such a dark period of psychiatric history that almost makes me feel a bit ashamed. But through the gore and being purposefully over the top that I can tell the series is... Actually, they gave a really accurate overview of the signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. That I was really impressed with. What do you think? As always, leave comments below. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, and I will try and have a look at episode three very soon. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye.